All right, back to our fuel nozzles. Uh, let's see, on, and I already said this, but we'll say it again. So on turbocharged, on turbo engines, um, this configuration result in fuel and air being blown out of the bleed. I said blow it back the other way because there's much, the pressure is higher in the cylinder. Uh, so on turbocharged engines, um, a shroud is used, or a shroud, a pressurized. Is used, that is uh, plumbed to upper deck pressure. So upper deck is going to be anything past the, uh, no, it's manifold, uh, between the turbo and the um, fuel control unit. We'll make, this, we'll make that five, we'll make this one four. On this particular thing, there is an A. This is the stupidest thing. An A is stamped, stamped on a wrench flat of the nozzle, which is let's say not that one. This one. Here we go. A little A that I drew on there. So there's an A right there on one of those little wrench flats. See that? Okay. There's an A. A is important. There's a wrench stamped on the wrench flat. A stamped on wrench flat. A stamped on wrench flat indicates indicates um, 180 degrees. I already wrote the degrees. 180 degrees from air bleed. So the A is opposite the air bleed. I should have wrote that. That's much it. A stamped on the on the wrench flat indicates 180 degrees from the air bleed. And uh, air from air bleed, I'll say hole in nozzle. I'll put hole in nozzle. So uh, install A toward the bottom. So bleed is up. So got to hide your a-hole there. Hide your a-hole indicator. So does that mean... Yeah. Why, why not put the A next to the bleed and install it so that you can see the A? That's the way I would have put it, but they didn't ask me. So you just put it on and turn it until the A is on the other side of it? And torque it until the A is down. Okay. So if the nozzle goes in this way... The A should be on the bottom. If it goes this way, it don't matter. <laughs> if it goes this way, the A goes on the bottom. So the air bleeds on the top. Okay. So it's like a tolerance, obviously, of torque. Start at the low and then... Another 40 inch pounds, if I'm not mistaken. So you just do the best you can. Just got to make sure that it's facing... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's actually... Um, yeah, there's a... It doesn't have to be down. It's, um, I think, 30 degrees from the bottom. 30... 30 degrees from bottom. So you have a tolerance. Uh, let's see. Maintenance stuff. Um, whenever you, when you have an engine that's running rough, one of the first things we do with a fuel injected engine is do a flow test. And what we do with the flow test is this right here is we get some cups of equal size that's a very important part some people say to use baby bottles I will tell you from experience that once you put 100 low lead in a baby bottle the babies do not like to use them anymore it apparently tastes bad so you pull the nozzles out of the cylinder put them back on the injector lines to get rid of the babies I don't know where you I don't know where you put the nipples. So turn on the boost pump, bring your idle mixture up, throttle up, 
have somebody outside watching it, run them until you get you know half free, a quarter up, enough so you can see it, and then shut everything off and see are they the same. If one is not the same, then you have and you got a blockage. So we have the flow test. Uh, let's see. I don't want to take a whole page to put this. Um, cups of equal size. Um, let me see. Cups of equal size. And then, then you run it. Um, let me see. Flow should be equal. So flow should be equal. Shouldn't even have to write that. Should be equal. If it's not, what do you have? Blockage. Blockage. All right. So to never clean with safety wire or drill bits or any sort of metallic stuff. So no wire or drills. Hmm. Recommended cleaner. Is either an ultrasonic cleaner or somebody tell me what this is called. Gun work cleaner or that's CLP. CLP? That's uh, Hoppies. Gun cleaner. What's that word? Hoppies. Hops. Hops. It's Hoppies. Okay, thank you. That's why I asked you to tell me. Some people say Hoppies. Most of my military people say Hops. So I'm going with Hops. And what did you call it, Pete? What? We, I thought it was, but now that I'm reading it, that's not CLP. What's CLP? Uh, cleaning lubricating protectant. Yeah. Oh. Nope, it's hops. Number nine. Don't use the eight the ten. or the ten. <laughs> so recommended cleaner. Why does it put or? Recommended cleaner. Um, is hops number nine for 20 minutes for 20 minutes that stuff works great for 20 minutes um, rinse clean with stoddard solvent if you don't know what stoddard solvent is it's the stuff you're running through the carburetors in the, in the lab Solvent and blow dry with compressed air. Blow dry with compressed air. Uh, do not over torque. You will break things. Do not over torque. Maybe I never mentioned this, but the wrench size is not the bolt size. And I'm noticing, not to pick on anybody, but you guys still are having problems reading torque, torque charts. You can't make up something. Like Magneto's drive member is the gear on the drive shaft. It is not the thing that holds it to the engine. So, oh, sorry, is that you? <laughs> Now you went to the low end. <laughs> so do not over torque. Um, over torquing will, will really uh, screw things up. Um, let's see, torque. Oh, yeah, torque. I'll write this down. It is 20 to 25 inch pounds. Um, hang on, I think that's primer line. I don't want to write that. Let me see. Yeah, I was correct before. Um, Nozzle body. Nozzle body, according to this video, is going to be 40 to 60 inch pounds. It is an eighth inch pipe thread, but don't do it for the eighth inch pipe thread. You're going to look for nozzle body torque. It's very specific. 40 to 60 inch pounds. And then the primer lines are 20 to 25 inch pounds. That is very low. Um, or finger tight, tight, um, plus one half of a flat. So you go all the way, and I'd use a wrench. I wouldn't try to do it finger tight. So I use a wrench um, until it's like finger tight because they're hard to get to, and then tighten it up half a flat. 
and that's 20 to 25 inch pounds. Actually, you're not gonna use a wrench, use a wrench. So get the B nut, it's called the B nut. Tighten it down. Um, one half, oops, two, one flat. That's it. Um, let's see. How often do you think you're gonna inspect and clean nozzles? Every day, no, 100 hours, pretty much. Um, let me see. What else we got? All right, let's do the video. It's gonna cover a lot of this stuff. Let's see if I can get it to work, actually. Who knows? Don't, don't get your hopes up. Let's see, first we gotta turn on some sound. Let's see if we get sound. We have sound. Does this even work? No, it doesn't. Oh, wait. It did a thing. Oh, now I killed it. Now I broke it. Ah, uh, there should be sound. Precision Airmotive has a 50-year reputation for quality and skill in radial engine overhaul and repair based on expert workmanship advanced overall equipment, and strict standards of quality control. Precision Airmotive is able to return better than new engines to its customers. We take great pride in our reputation earned through decades of performing safely and dependably under all flying conditions. Precision Airmotive expanded the scope of production operations to include the manufacture and support of aircraft engine carburetors and other accessory components. We're the only source for original factory new Bendix Pause. Oh, wait a minute. I know how to, wait, there's a thing here. What do I want? Um, oh, dang it, I closed everything. Um, we'll, edit, we'll edit this part out. You want me to make it bigger or are you fine? I would not search on the school website. <laughs> how to make it bigger. Come on, guys, get together. The quality here is not as good, but it should be. The original the manufacturer and works. support of aircraft engine car system was originally designed by Bendix in the early 1960s, and surprisingly, very few technicians are familiar with its required maintenance items. It steadily evolved through the years to the advanced system we know today. The RSA fuel injection technology used in today's aviation fuel injection systems is a state-of-the-art system. Proper preventative system knowledge and maintenance is the easiest way to help keep the system operating to its full engine TVO. You want to take a couple of notes Let's start with the fuel yeah. servo unit. Maintenance on the fuel servo unit is required at 50 hours. Because like a lot of my test questions came off of this video. Hmm. Our intervals. The inlet filter must be inspected and cleaned after the first 25 hours of operation and then at 50 hour intervals. By the way, the filter should be inspected and cleaned at each annual regardless of accumulated hours since the last inspection. Inlet fittings vary from union type fittings to 90 degree elbows. Be careful. These fittings are specifically modified for the filter assembly. Now, to get at the filter, you need to first remove the inlet fitting. Don't, however, remove the plug opposite the inlet fitting to get at the filter. Doing this allows any contamination that is on the filter to be introduced into the servo unit. I promise you that will be at least an oral test question. Remove the fitting using clean, correctly sized wrenches. Once the fitting is removed, it's easy to remove the filter. attached to the inlet fitting, it's not considered a bypassing type and should be replaced. Filter inspection is fairly easy. Checking the outside surface for particulate matter or peering down the middle isn't enough. The fuel flows from the inside out when installed in the servo unit. Contamination, after all, will show up here on the inlet filter long before it can cause any kind of operational problem. Now's the time to catch it by locating and correcting the source of contamination. Dry the filter with air. Now, tap it. Open side down on a clean piece of paper. Examine any contamination and determine the type and source. 
Next, look into the center of the filter while shining a light through the outside. You should be able to see the light through the weave on most surface areas. You could also blow through the dry filter. There should be very little restriction to airflow. Clean the filter using acetone or MEK, followed by a rinse in soldered solvent and then air drying. If the fitting is damaged or corroded, it must be replaced. By the way, corrosion is a fairly good indication that the aircraft fuel system contains a high level of water contamination. Obtaining precision air motive O-rings, and only these specific O-rings, is essential before you begin the filter cleaning process. We recommend you always replace these packings each time the filter is cleaned. Standard AN or MS O-rings might appear identical, but using the wrong O-ring on the inlet fitting has been known to exert sufficient force to crack the servo unit housing. Refer to Service Bulletin RS-44. Check the precision part numbers to ensure you're flying with the proper O's. While you're at it, inspect all fuel hoses for signs of deterioration. Teflon lines in most cases should be installed between the servo unit and flow divider, pressurizing valve or splitters. Refer to the appropriate engine or airframe maintenance manual for specific information. Also, take a look at Lycoming Service Instruction 1274 for additional information on hose application. For filter installation, refer to the appropriate service manual for installation and torque instructions. Cleaning the fuel injection nozzles is next. Hoppy's number 9 gun cleaning solvent is the best cleaning solution. A 20 to 30 minute soaking is all that's usually necessary. Then, follow with solvent rinse and then air dry prior to inspection. A nozzle is not necessarily clean and satisfactory for use if the cleaning solution no longer changes color. The proper inspection of field inspecting these assemblies is through the use of a 10 power magnifying glass. Both fuel nozzles and fuel restrictors should be shiny clean with no evidence of film or particulate contamination. Only proper inspection can verify a nozzle has been properly cleaned. An increase in indicated fuel flow at various power settings is generally the first indication that nozzles need cleaning. Engine operational problems occur if contamination becomes extreme. Substantial fuel stains around the nozzle also indicate the need for cleaning. And, like the filter, any unusual contaminant should be identified and its source located and corrected. Be sure to refer to Bendix Bulletin RS-77, Revision 2, and Lycoming Service Instruction 1414. Do not, under any circumstances, use lock wire, pins, or other metal items to remove contamination from the nozzles. This affects calibration. When cleaning two-piece nozzle assemblies, be sure each restrictor is kept with its respective body. Simply use separate containers for each... You got that? These are not... This is a married pair, and that's a matched pair. So if you put all of the bottom ones in one cup and all the top in the other cup, then you have to replace them all. Replace them all. Also, never use what to clean it? Wire. Wire. It's not assembly. If you're only cleaning the restrictors, which is permitted between annual inspections, work with each cylinder separately by removing, cleaning, inspecting, and reinstalling the restrictor and reconnecting the fuel line. Remember, if you lose a fuel restrictor, you'll have to buy an entire new nozzle body assembly. These restrictors are flow matched to their respective bodies and are only sold as assemblies. Only proper inspection can verify a nozzle has been properly cleaned. The nozzles used with the precision air motive fuel injection system have a fuel orifice diameter of approximately 28 thousandths of an inch. As mentioned before, the only proper method of field inspecting these assemblies is through the use of a 10 power magnifying glass. With older style nozzles, check the top threads at the fuel line connection for damaged threads and or cracks. New and old style nozzles for normally aspirated engines are interchangeable with one another and may be used in any combination on an engine. Okay, he doesn't mean that these are interchangeable. He means the new, this two-piece one can go in an engine that has a one-piece right next to it, is what he means by they're interchangeable. But these two parts are matched. By the way, standard nozzles flow at 32 pounds per square inch. Now, there are assemblies referred to as high-flow nozzles. 
The inserts of these high-flow nozzles are identified with a step on their circumference and have a larger diameter to prevent installation into the wrong body. Always refer to the engine manufacturer's publications prior to ordering your placement nozzle assemblies. Now, inspect the nozzle fuel lines before installing your freshly cleaned nozzles. Although these lines are supplied by the engine manufacturer, their condition is critical to the proper operation of the system. Here's what to check. The inside diameter of lines used on most engines should be 85 to 95 thousandths of an inch. If a replacement is needed, do not substitute other lines, like the smaller ID primer lines. A small line on any one cylinder can cause that cylinder to run leaner than the others. By the way, line length is not critical to the operation of the precision air motive system. Check the lines for signs of longitudinal twisting, a sign of over torqued nuts. Also, inspect for kicks. The minimum bend radius for a line is 62 hundredths of an inch. Check the nuts for cracks. And inspect the ferro braze joint and surrounding area for cracking. Fuel dye stains are the giveaway. Install the nozzles using a clean six-point deep well socket. You'll likely have to install your socket over the nozzle first and then attach your extensions and torque wrench. Nozzles are so often damaged by trying to force a socket and extension past engine baffling and over a partially installed nozzle. Baffling is also damaged. Torque nozzles or nozzle bodies to 40 inch pounds. 60 inch pounds is the absolute maximum torque to be applied. In a very few instances, your installation might require the alignment of the A. In such cases, increase the torque according to the manual instructions, but don't exceed the maximum torque allowances referred to in the RSA Operations and Service Manual. On nozzles installed horizontally, the A should point down 30 degrees. Remember, if you have the newer two-piece assemblies, check to ensure that the fuel restrictors are properly installed. On engines that have nozzles installed horizontally, leave the shipping cap installed until you connect the fuel line. Improper line connection is a common source of damage. Again, with the two-piece nozzles, failing to follow procedures usually means a new set of nozzles. When installing nozzle fuel lines, make certain all threads are clean. It's first necessary to install the nut finger tight. Now, you have two options. Try to use a torque wrench with adapters if room permits and torque the nut 25 to 50 inch pounds. Or, use a standard 7 16 inch open end wrench and continue to tighten the nut one half to one flat of the nut from the finger tight position and stop. This technique has proven to provide a 25 to 50 inch pound torque limit. Exceeding the 50 inch pound torque limit usually does result in nozzle damage. When you've completed the fuel system maintenance, recheck that nothing was overlooked. Pressure test the system for fuel leaks with the mixture and idle cutoff. Now you're ready for ground run. Minor adjustment of idle speed and mixture if necessary. And return to service. And don't forget your logbook entry. Of course, in all cases, please refer to the proper manual. There's no more effective way of pinpointing a problem or potential problem than locating its source through the process of troubleshooting. And to troubleshoot effectively, one must analyze the problem, its probable causes, and the necessary actions to correct the problem. No wonder troubleshooting is considered an art. Anyone can shotgun an engine's problem, but it's extremely costly for the owner of pilot, and it teaches the technician nothing. Precision Air Motive suggested troubleshooting procedure for engines, their systems and components follows five basic steps. First, study the symptoms. Secondly, isolate the system affected. Now, determine the probable causes. Then, check and prepare the system. And finally, test and document your actions. This segment of our video aids the owner-operator in the troubleshooting technique for the RSA fuel injection system. Of course, read all bulletins carefully before removing a unit for compliance. Take careful note of the section which identifies the units affected by the bulletin and by the part 
card number and serial number if listed. First of all, grab an inspection run-up sheet. You'll find one, which may be copied, by the way, on page two of Precision Air Motive's Troubleshooting Techniques for the RSA Fuel Metering System Manual, Form 15810B, technically speaking. Note that the inspection run-up sheet is divided into two sections, pre- and post-inspection. Remember, the more information you can supply to the factory, the better the factory can help you isolate your problem. Information like parts list numbers, how many total hours since a major overhaul on the servo unit, the engine size and number, and so on, are very helpful. I think there's air in my fuel system. What's going on? So, you think there might be air in your fuel system? Okay, let's take a look. First, take a 12 to 14 inch length of clear Teflon tubing and connect it between the servo unit fuel line and flow divider. This tubing should be clamped between two AM style fittings. Now, start and run your engine and watch for air bubbles. It's very important that you not run your engine, by the way, without the calving for sustained periods of time as engine damage might occur. If air bubbles are discovered, locate their source. The primary sources are deteriorated fuel hoses, deteriorated main fuel pump inlet fitting seals, Take a look at my filming service bulletin 374 for more information on this one. Airframe boost pump shaft seal leakage. Damaged cones and flares on fuel line fittings. And fuel lines routed too close to the exhaust system. By the way, fuel fittings and lines can leak air and not fuel. If having the boost pump on improves operation, then a leaky fitting or hose is possible between the boost pump and the main fuel pump. A large air leak or boost pump shaft seal leak may not give improved operation with the boost pump on. What is going on? Lately, when I'm at idle cutoff, my engine has a tendency to run on. What gives? Keep in mind that when your throttle's in idle cutoff position, the manual mixture control on the RS-RSA fuel injector will only reduce fuel flow sufficiently to stop the engine. It is not intended as a fuel shutoff valve. If your engine has the tendency to run off with the mixture in idle cutoff, better check the integrity of the servo unit. First, disconnect the fuel outlet lines from the servo. A flexible hose or clear tube can be attached to direct fuel from an end nozzle into a separate container. A baby bottle is perfect because it's calibrated in cc's. Whatever the container, the measurement process is critical. Now, open the throttle approximately halfway and place the mixture control level in the idle cutoff position. Turn on the boost pump and look for leakage from the outlet. Allow two minutes for this test. Hopefully there's no leakage. Great. If there is a leak, measure the amount of captured fuel and divide by two, or however many minutes you let the boost pump run. This value is the cutoff valve leakage. Now don't be upset at leaks. Even new units directly from the factory are allowed to leak up to five cc's per minute. If leakage exceeds 7 to 8 cc's per minute, dive into Bendix Service Information Letter 16, Revision 2, or later, to repair the servo. My engine at idle sounds like a discontented duck. What do I do to smooth it out? Though attempting to smooth out the idle speed, off idle stumble is normally the result of having the following items misadjusted. The idle mixture length was misadjusted too long or too short. The idle speed adjustment was backed out too far, compensating for a possible induction leak. Or, the magneto to engine timing was advanced from 3 to 5 degrees past the manufacturer's recommendations to smooth out the idle after the first two adjustments. Now, to correct the off-idle stumble situation, first, remove the idle mixture link and reset to the proper settings as set forth by the master cleavage settings for parts lists in the Troubleshooting Techniques Manual, pages 11 through 13. Then, reinstall the idle mixture link. Again, refer to the master cleavage settings list for exact cleavage settings for a particular parts list control. Of course, of course, referencing, referencing this, this master cleavage settings list is vital. Next, time the magnetos to the engine. Refer to the engine manufacturer's instructions. Now, start your engine and let it warm up. 
Then, set the idle speed to the recommended speed. Set the idling mixture to obtain a 25 to 50 RPM rise. Be sure to clear your engine after each adjustment. And now, reset the idle speed as necessary. If off-idle stumble persists, here are some possible causes. There's an intake manifold air leak. Perhaps the manifold drain is sticking open. Or there might be loose pipes or damaged couplings. Uh, some aircraft have manifold drains called sniffle valves. And what it is, it's a, it's a valve that you put on the manifold that has a ball in it. And so the ball, when the engine's off, the ball will fall and uh, it leaves it an open drain. So if you accidentally did over prime it, which is run the boost pump, that fuel will collect and run down through that ball valve and out. When you start the engine, because there's a vacuum, it sucks the ball up into a seat and then plugs that up. So it's really common to see them sticking open. And it's even more common to see them completely packed full of bugs and stuff and never even opened. Or so o there, there might be a damaged damage nozzle, nozzle or plugged plug air bleed. Perhaps, Perhaps the, the magneto, magneto internal, internal timing, timing might be wrong or shifted. shifted. The, the flow divider, divider might, might be sticking, sticking open. open. There, there might, might be air in the fuel, fuel system. system. Or the, the servo, servo unit regulator, regulator is contaminated. contaminated. In, that in that case, send it in for a repair. It's important to know that idle speed and mixture adjustments may be made with the boost pump on or off. If there's a noticeable shift in the engine's operation at idle with the boost pump on versus off, your servo unit might need to be returned for correction of pressure sensitivity. Take the time to troubleshoot effectively. You'll save money, time, and headaches. Remember, read all bulletins carefully before removing a unit for compliance. If you're in doubt, Call, Call us, us and, and ask Braille. Braille. There are two things more frustrating than trying to start a hot engine. But sooner or later, the problem rears its ugly vapor lock in each brand of engine and all makes of airframes to some degree. But take heart. Using the right technique saves you lots of headaches. Let's take a look at the problem. An air-cooled engine starts hot between 15 minutes and 2 hours after shutdown. There are several factors which, when combined, make starting airplane engines hot or cold difficult. Aircraft engines are quite simple. They don't have chokes for cold starting, and they don't meter fuel precisely at below idle speeds. Aviation fuel many times fails to vaporize easily at startup. Weak, low RPM spark from magnetos, poor mixture distribution, and updraft preparations are all elements of hot starting. How to alleviate hot starts? Make sure your magnetos are strong, spark plugs are clean and properly gapped, and and make sure your ignition harness is in good shape. Check, Check your fuel, fuel injection system's idle mixture adjustments. There, there should be a 50 RPM rise as you shut, shut down, down with the mixture control. control. Make, make sure, sure your primer system, system works properly. properly. Most, Most fuel, fuel injection systems, systems don't meter fuel, fuel very accurately at low engine speeds. speeds. The RSA, the RSA fuel, fuel injection system calls for the priming to provide the majority of the fuel needed for the first few tentative combustion events. Fuel, fuel pressure, pressure is regulated at the throttle body, body which, which means you can't force extra fuel, fuel through the system, system with the boost pump. And, and fuel, fuel delivery lines, lines sit on top of the engine directly over the cylinder fins. fins. Fuel, fuel is simply boiled out of the lines as heat ripples off the just shut down engine. engine. Precision's RSA fuel injection system is a mechanical continuous flow system. Both the throttle and mixture control should be fully forward for maximum fuel flow. Here's the recommended procedure for the Cessna cargo with light light going. Throttle up in one quarter. Boost pump on. Mixture move from idle cutoff to full ridge to obtain a 3 to 5 gallon per hour fuel flow. Then back to idle cutoff. Boost pump off and engage the starter. In theory, the engine will catch within a few revolutions. And you can push the mixture smoothly to a full ridge as power develops, then retard the throttle to the desired idle speed. Now, now, there's, there's a few, a few common, common sense reminders. Tricks of the hot start trade. trade. Always park on the way. Open the cow flaps and even pop open the oil filler door, too. In this, In this way, hot air escapes from the top of the cow and helps to draw cool air out from the alpha area. 
It's very important to get airflow through the cow valve after shutdown. Of course, when you're faced with a hot start, always follow the procedures presented in the operating manual. on there number nine I forget what size he said the nozzle openings were but I figured out that a 025 safety wire should fit in there real nice don't no do it. don't do it 28,000 yeah. 28, yes 025 fit fit real nice shouldn't it um, don't over torque let me see um, <laughs> very nice class 3 fit uh, let's see, primer line versus uh, injector line. What was the warning there? They're different sizes. Don't use primer lines. Those injector lines have brazed fittings. Uh, I would never make one in the field. I'd, I would buy them. It's uh, they're, they're a little too sensitive for that. Let me see. Um, what else? Do not mix. Do not mix the um, nozzle inserts. So you may have an engine that has some new style nozzles with two piece, and you may have some nozzles that are a single piece. Can you mix and match on the same engine? Yes. Yes, yes you can. Um, if you over tighten the primer, the primer line, the injector line, what are you likely going to do? Crack what? Uh, probably the nut. The nut will split usually. Let me see. Because it's a brass, you said soft brass. Huh? Because it's soft brass. Yeah. Yep. Let me see. Nozzle body torque. Can you mix and match the nozzle types? Can you mix and match where the nozzles go? Yeah. Unless it's ga unless it's a gammy, yep. Uh, let's see. Fuel I already did all that. This goes here, that goes there. Um, tightening adjustments. What are my two adjustments? Idle speed, idle speed. Idle speed, idle adjustment. What is that screw right there going to adjust? Speed. Speed. What is this one going to do? Mixture. Mixture. All right. We pull the idle cutoff. We should see 50 RPM rise. Um, what happens if you accidentally screw this all the way out? The yeah. mixture. There yeah, you go. Master clevis list to reset it. Um, what else we got here? And when they were saying that you disconnected from the system, like the way he was saying it in the video, you take it off the system? Yeah, just unscrew that whole thing. Once it comes up, take it out of both sides, mm -hmm. look at the master clevis list, put it all back together correctly. I've never run into a situation where I've accidentally screwed that up, so I don't think it's as easy to do as you lead you believe. Um, let's see. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Master clevis list to reset what? The idle mixture screw setup because it's the distance between that bolt and that bolt is what sets everything up uh, let's see uh, we're not uh, venting of fuel tanks since we're at it as a mechanic um, we'll put proper fuel tank venting Fuel tank venting is a, is a much bigger deal than, than we talk about because usually it's not a problem <laughs> until it is a problem. Then it's a big problem. Um, with a gravity-fed carbureted system, uh, Cessna even had problems. Uh, the 150s had an airworthiness directive where um, 
I had a, one vented cap and one fuel vent. I think they put the fuel, the fuel vent went on the um, left side and the cap on the right. That wasn't even enough. So they went to three vents. Because uh, what would happen is, you know, as the fuel's flowing and you're creating that space there, well, it created a vacuum if you don't have proper vent, and then the fuel would stop flowing. So that became a problem. Uh, if you have a fuel injected engine where you have a pump sucking fuel out of the tank, when you plug up the vent, it will sometimes collapse the tank. Uh, is that, I've heard of people with low wings looking out and seeing a big old dent in their wing. Yeah, I've had that happen. Have you really? You guys heard of mud daubers? It's a big deal. I don't know if it's just the valley here, but it's a problem here. <laughs> I don't know what they look like, but I know what they leave behind. And they're, some people call them leaf rollers. And it's some sort of bug that takes little pieces of leaves and stuff, and they go inside of very small tubes, pedo tubes especially, and they build these nests inside there that, man, you just can't get them out. I had to get one out of plane one time, and I mean, I had shop air at 110 psi, and I'm just holding it, going, "Damn, I can't. The air won't go through." All of a sudden, it's pow, and it hit the <laughs> clock on the wall. It fell. It's out now. <laughs> but yeah, so you got to watch those. What's that? Unless we worry about the snakes on our planes. I'd rather worry about mud divers. <laughs> All right. Uh, eventually, if you the the tank will only cave so far, and then you'll starve the engine for fuel. So that's then that's bad. So all right, I think we have covered the RSA fuel injection system. And let me see. Uh, what kind of system is it? Continuous flow. Continuous flow. What's air metering force? What is fuel metering force? Unmetered minus metered. Ooh, very good. Unmetered minus metered. Um, if the diaphragm between metered and unmetered fails, the engine will, there we go. What happens? Diaphragm between meter and unmeter fuel rupture. The engine will run rich, idle, all power settings. All power settings plus idle. All right, think it through. This fails, means we have no more fuel metering force. Are we going to have air metering force? Yes. Right, so we'll pull the pop it. And so it'll run very rich. rich. Um, the diaphragm between impact and venturi ruptured, right here, the engine will run lean. We should uh, only have a spring holding it open if it's still intact. So lean at all power settings above idle. So it should run still fine at idle because you got the springs going to hold it open. Um, let's see. What happens at the metering orifice? As I make it larger, what happens to my fuel metering force? More flow, more pressure. So that equal, that gets closer to equal. And if it's closer to equal, you have less fuel metering force. Um, fuel dripping out of the impact tubes would be an indication of a seal between. Yep, the seal right there going out. So, um, flow divider. Does it do any metering? Yes. Okay. On, on this system. On this system, and do the fuel nozzles do any metering? No. They have a they have an orifice. It's point oh two eight. So if they do, it's only at full throttle. Full throttle. Got it? All right. Guess it's time to go.
No. We, if you want, we start 